So hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I'll be presenting today with my colleague, Andre, uh, about serverless ML deployment and on AWS. Um, OK, so let's start with some introdu introductions. Uh, my name is Shimon. Um, I studied here in Prague at Charles University. I've been living here for 12 years now. And uh, after I was finished with school, I spent uh, I did some gigs in game development. Uh, and then I joined Represent in 2014 when it was founded. <clears throat> and Andre, who's here with me, uh, he actually studied in Glasgow, and he joined Represent in 2014 as well, and we've been working there as software engineers uh, since then. All right, and uh, let me give a brief introduction of the company, uh, Represent. How many of you know Represent? All right, so, <laughs> like four people, that's great. Um, so, uh, so, Represent is an online, um, uh, merchandising platform um, for mostly for influencers and celebrities uh, where they can sell rank, rank campaigns and sell merchandise like t-shirts, uh, hoodies, etc. One of our biggest campaigns to date uh, was one with Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, and we worked with him on this design that he's wearing and within one week of running the campaign we made a million dollars and sold uh, almost 70,000 t-shirts. Um, the great thing about Represent is usually with these celebrity, huge celebrity campaigns, we're, we're raising money for, for charities and for nonprofits. And with Arnold, uh, he's been raising money for a nonprofit supporting lo um, students for lo from low income families in the US. Um, fun fact about Represent it has three co founders. The one on the left uh, is from Britain, one in the middle is from Slovakia, it's Andre. And one on the right is, uh, is an American. So it's pretty kind of diverse nationality wise. And Represent was acquired by Customing in 2016 in one of the <coughs> most successful startup stories in Czechoslovakia. And we have offices here in Prague, in Los Angeles, and in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. Um, here in Prague, we're in the beautiful Carlin, and um, we're all, our doors are always open for, for you to visit and have, have a chat with us. So. Uh, Come anytime. It's a beautiful office. All right. Now we're getting closer to the topic at hand. So machine learning. I know this is a AWS meetup. So how many of you have played around with some kind of machine learning, training your own model, doing some experiments? All right. Nice. So yeah, it's a, there's been a lot of hype uh, in the past few years. Um, so I'll, I'll just briefly lead you through what the typical machine learning project or process looks like. OK, sorry about the size of the font, but I'll be talking uh, loud about what's there. So the first phase of a machine learning process is usually um, getting some data, getting some data that you can train on, because machine learning is all about data. Um, so you have to figure out where, what's your data source, uh, where are your labels, and what do you even want to use uh, to train with. Once you have, usually people work with data engineering team to figure that out. Uh, once, once you have that, you need to prepare your data, do some data exploration, create some pipelines and feature extraction. And then you're ready for the, the most interesting part for most people, which is model training. So then you, you, you take a model, for example, neural networks. There's been a, uh, a lot of talking about deep learning in the past few years. So that's what all, all of this, is, what this box is all about. Uh, but after you're done and you have a model that's performing well and you want to want to get it to production and uh, want to make, make it useful, you have to deploy your model. And you can deploy it uh, in various ways, and we'll be talking about that today. And once it's deployed, you can generate predictions from this model for new data that you haven't seen before. So today's talk, we're just talking about the model deployment uh, part of the process. Um, and we find it interesting because it's, it's not usually a popular topic at talks. People usually like to talk just about the model training. All right, so now we've cracked the ML part of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of today's topic. Um, so I'll be moving on to how to deploy, uh, how to deploy, how you can deploy a machine learning model uh, to production. So this table shows various ways of deploying, and on the right hand side uh, is the AWS service that you would probably uh, choose to deploy uh, in that fashion. So the kind of traditional old school 
a way of deploying any application uh, <coughs> is, is a hosted server like EC2, uh, where you have to kind of provision your, your, your hardware, you have to kind of maintain it, make sure it's running, etc. You, you are taking care of the environment. Uh, a more advanced, uh, <coughs> more advanced way of deployment uh, that's been more and more getting more and more popular in recent recent years is kind of is a container uh, based approach, either using Docker or uh, or a whole ecosystem like Kubernetes. And in AWS, you can use ECS or EKS for that. Um, but what we are talking about today is the serverless way. Okay. How many of you know what serverless is? All right, awesome, almost everyone. Uh, we'll go through what it is either way. <laughs> um, and in, in AWS, you have services like uh, Lambda or Fargate to, to take advantage of the serverless paradigm, I would call it. Um, there are also solutions that are focused on machine learning specifically. In AWS, that would be SageMaker, for example. Uh, but the way it deploys your model to production is more closer to the EC2 way than to serverless. So we're focusing on serverless here because that's what we're interested in as developers right now. All right, so there we have it. What is serverless? So I'll just go over this real quickly. Quickly, It's a new paradigm of running your code. Um, also sometimes it's called function as a service because the, the, the central piece of your deployment is your function and not the environment. And usually a serverless deployment is fully managed by the provider. So in our case, Amazon is, is managing the environment and the instances that run your code or run your function. And you don't care about um, like the operating system and maintaining it. Yeah, and so the advantages uh, usually mean you don't have to maintain your uh, servers, you don't have to take care of patching, Ubuntu upgrading. Um, uh, so that's a great weight off your shoulders, especially if you're trying to follow the kind of dev DevOps uh, paradigm. Um, you get scaling for free, and it's not for free. Uh, it doesn't cost you any money. Of course it does, but you don't need to set it up explicitly. You don't need to set up auto-scaling and set up kind of rules or anything. You can just send two requests to AWS Lambda at the same time, and you will get two instances uh, spin up, and uh, they will process uh, the requests in parallel. Uh, sometimes also means easier development. For example, if you want to respond to HTTP requests, um, you don't really have to have a web framework in your application because Lambda takes care of that together with, uh, with the API gateway. And last one on the, uh, on the menu is lower infrastructure cost. Um, and this is especially true for services that don't really need to run 24 seven. So if, uh, you're, uh, if, if, you, if you need a uh, certain service only throughout the day and in the night your customers are asleep, you don't actually need your server to be running. And with, with serverless, you only pay for the time that your code is being executed. So oftentimes you can see a lower lower cost actually uh, for, for what you need than an, a managed EC2 instance, for example. All right, and so now we're, all, we're already there. We have all the pieces. And we'll be talking about Python machine learning deployment on AWS Lambda. So why Amazon? I probably don't need to tell you. Uh, Amazon is the number one cloud provider. Most companies are using it. Uh, it's the most stable and uh, it's the most developed one. And why, why Python? Uh, you probably know this, but Python is currently the kind of number one technology for machine learning projects. Um, most of the popular libraries now live in Python and people are using Python to develop. Uh, machine learning solutions. Awesome. So, finally, the question is, can I host my Python machine learning model on AWS Lambda? And to answer the question, I'm uh, leaving the floor to Andre. Thank you. Yes. Hmm? This one is next slide. Cool, thank you. All right, so the answer to that question, the question is yes. But unfortunately, with an asterisk. And why is that that there is an asterisk? It's just that there are a couple issues or basic concerns that we need to be aware of when we decide to do something like this. So um, one of the first things that we need to talk about, which is not really an issue specifically for machine learning or Python projects on Lambda, 
and it's most like an issue that we need to be aware of for any kind of uh, serverless approach in general, and that is the issue of call starts. So what happens when you deploy your code to Lambda, and then you do a request to invoke that code? So Amazon has to basically boot up some kind of piece of hardware, put your code in there, and write. And that obviously takes time. Fortunately, though, when you do a second request or, and more subsequent requests to your function, those will be faster because that environment will already be ready and basically be ready to receive requests. Um, since uh, the whole thing, the whole Lambda is managed by Amazon, we do not know any particular, uh, particulars about when that function is going to shut down or how long is it going to live. So after a while, we don't know how long, particularly, but we know that it's going to shut down. Usually, when there's less request to the function, it's going to shut down sooner. And then after that, we <coughs> will experience another call start. Um, one thing we need to be aware of as well is that when we do a parallel request to a function that has not been basically is, is shut down at this moment, um, when you do a parallel request, let's say like 10 of them, all 10 of those will experience call start just because we don't have 10 instances alive at this moment. If we had, then we, do, we wouldn't have a call start. So what people do sometimes is that they do something called pre-warming, and that's basically they do, uh, they periodically do requests to their functions, and that will keep them quote unquote alive, and any sort of requests that come from the customers will have that live instance, or in other words, the pre-warm instance, and they will not experience any sort of like delay which can be a couple of seconds. Um, back to the topic of machine learning, though, there's another thing that is sort of similar to the call start um, worry that we have, and that's a worry of loading a machine learning model into memory. So basically, our machine learning model might be a couple of kilobytes if it's very, very simple, or it can be a couple of gigabytes if it's very complicated. So let's say that we want to load that into memory, and obviously that's going to take time in when the model is bigger. And fortunately though, we can, in Lambda, we can load the model into memory on the first request, keep it in memory, and any kind of subsequent request can handle uh, basically any kind of like prediction that we want to, want to do from the model. Um, in the very or they don't need to load the model again. Um, so obviously though, the first request is going to experience more delay because of the model loading, so we need to be aware of that. The second issue and the biggest issue which we had to overcome, and this is partly is the biggest issue that we had when we tried to do this, was that um, Lambda has a certain file size limit that you can put on it. So the code that you want to deploy has to have less than 250 megabytes. And that it includes basically all your code, all your machine learning models that you want to um, basically deploy this way, including also any kind of packages. And in terms of Python, those packages can be pretty big. So for example, scikit-learn is the, I think is the number one package, uh, which is used by machine learning people in Python. And just that one is, and that one plus its dependencies is just over 200, or can be over 200 megabytes. So that will leave us less than 50 megabytes for our own things that we want to put it in besides scikit-learn. If we want to do some kind of like deep learning in Lambda, uh, we will need most likely TensorFlow or a single library. And unfortunately, like the newer versions of TensorFlow like getting pretty bloated. They'll put like a lot of code in there. And it's just, it's well over 250 megabytes. So that's kind of like an issue for us if you wanted to do that. So um, at this point, you might ask, like, did you say, is your development? I mean, that's a little bit fair questions after like all those issues that I pointed out. Um, so we have kind of like a solution to that, and that is called Lambify. So Lambify is basically like a tool that we develop for the purpose of basically making Python packages a little, little bit leaner and make them um, well behaved in terms of so that we can deploy them on the Lambda <coughs> well easier. Um, usually we would have to do like a lot of hacks that basically a lot of smart people have figured out over the years. I posted about them in blog posts and GitHub, but unfortunately there hasn't been like any sort of like a centralized tool that would do all those hacks. 
that would basically put all those packages in sort of like a uh, reasonable size for, for the server's environment. Um, so what we find that is basically, um, it, basically we have identified a couple of packages that are kind of you know, problematic in this way, and basically like provided a way for us to build them in such a way that basically we can put them on the server less. So to be more specific, what does it actually do? Um, um, we have to talk about like why are those packages so so big? Why why do we have that issue? And the problem is that these packages contain a lot of binaries. Those binaries contain usually a lot of functions that are important for machine learning, some kind of mathematical functions, statistical functions, that kind of thing. And fortunately, what we can do is we can use a Unix strip command to basically take the binaries and strip any sort of like symbols that we do not need in there and this reduces their size significantly. Unfortunately though, if, um, if we do a strip command on the binaries that have been packaged and provided on PyPy, which is the Python package uh, sort of repository, it will not work because those binaries are not um, built for specifically for the AWS environment that runs on Lambda. So what we have to do is basically compile those packages ourselves in a Docker container which contains the same environment, strip those packages afterwards, and after that we can do some other things like um, remove unneeded files like tests, cached files, that are in their package metadata. And as an example, we can take a package called SysIPy, which is like at the base of pretty much all of those machine learning packages that we would want to use, and on that one, we would reduce the size from 140 to about 33 megabytes. So as you can see, that's a pretty big difference. So uh, let's talk about an example. Um, we are talking today about how to put machine learning projects on Lambda. However, there are some considerations, as I said, that have to be made. Not all machine learning projects are going to be suitable to be put on Lambda. We have to be aware of some kind of limits that Lambda has, and those will be specifically at this moment. Those limits tend to change, but at this moment it will be like three gigabytes of RAM memory. Um, there's a temporary partition that you can write to, and that's half a gigabyte. So, for example, if you need to store a model there and it's bigger than that, you probably wouldn't want to choose Lambda for that. Um, and there's also a limit on how long a Lambda can run. So, let's just go for an example of a very simple thing that we would be able to do, and just what it looks like. So, we are going to be looking at an example that the specification of images. Specifically, those images are going to be um, in the data set, which is a famous data set which is used for benchmarking most image classification models, and it's a data set that contains handwritten digits. So we are going to take a model, train it on this, and then see what it can predict on Lambda. So we are going to show a simple image classifier, as I said, it's, trained. it's going to be trained on this. We were heavily inspired by this person's blog post. So you can see the link over there. Um, we'll provide a link to the presentation later. So if you want to check out any links that we provide in the presentation slides, you can do that. And we are going to be, use, we are going to be using AWS SAM for deployment. SAM is sort of like a CLI tool uh, created by Amazon specifically for deploying Lambdas. And also we're going to be using Pipen for dependency management. Pipen is a Python tool, <coughs> which basically allows you to create like a special, a special virtual environment for any project and will installs your Python packages related to that project to that specific virtual environment, which is pretty nice. So I'm going to show some code. Uh, the code is going to be heavily simplified and some uh, things are going to be left out. So we'll do it just for demonstrational purposes. Um, we actually provide an example working code. Um, so there's, there's probably a link somewhere in the, in the slides. Um, so first of all, we're just going to fetch the MIS data set. Um, we are going to put that data set into a classifier. We just say train and learn, like from this set, whatever you can. Obviously, we provide some kind of features, build from that data set and some labels, which says basically what kind of digit that is. After that, we can just dump the model, send it to the release. And this is going to happen, for example, we could do it like on here, Shimon's laptop, and train that way. 
then we create a file called predicted by, and this is actually the code that is going to be run on our Lambda. So first, what is that that's going to be doing? It's going to look, it's going to load a model. Then we have to define a function that is actually going to be the entry point for our function, for for the Lambda function specifically. And what it does, it's going to uh, receive some kind of context. In this context, it will re uh, receive uh, information about the request that we made. And what we are going to do, we are going to put a basically a URL of an image into that request so that we can download that image and feed it into the classifier. Mm -hmm. You could also do things like like actually put the image into the body of the requests and do that as well. Uh, it's up to you. We are going to just feed the image into the classifier, take a prediction, and return it to the user. Pretty simple. Then one more piece that we need, and that's a template file. The template file, this, this, file, this template file is going to be used by Sam. It's pretty much a cloud formation uh, file. Are you guys aware of what cloud formation is? Okay, some of you are. Basically, cloud formation is a way on Amazon that lets you define what kind of resources you use, you want to what you want to use, what kind of relationships they have. So basically, create roles and stuff like that. We basically just spin up like the whole file formation stack, which has been defined in a kind of like template like this. And what's there's going to be a bunch of stuff, a bunch of resources defined on your template. But what we, what we are interested in now is the function. So the definition of the function, one of the function, like something like this. So we just says that build or take the code, which is, which is in the build directory, and we'll put it on the lambda. And our handler, which is the entry point of the function, is going to be the Predict function, which is in the predicted by file, which I showed you on the previous slide. Mm. All right, so now we can basically build all the pieces that we need and we want to deploy them. So what do we do? There's a bunch of commands, um, which might look kind of scary, but just quickly go through them and one by one and just see what they do. So first we want to install packages that we need uh, then we want to install packages that we actually need for deployment. That's going to be Lambda Pi, which I talked about earlier, and also SAM. Then we want to train our classifier, so that just runs the train script within a PPNF environment. Then we want to um, build our packages into a build directory. We also want to specify that we want to use the PPNF um, as a sort of like what to take the package definitions from. We want to also include our predict file, which is going to be like the main entry point of the function, and our model, which we have saved after the training process. And then the last two steps are the actual deployment. So this just says to Sam to package, or basically to take our build folder and just upload it to S3. And then the last one just takes that S3 bucket, or the S3, um, basically, Thing that we uploaded and say create a function from this and make it available and create all those other resources that we <coughs> find in the cloud formation cloud. All right then. So we actually gone and uh, deployed uh, exactly the same thing that we have demonstrated. And Shimon will now show us how it, what can do. Okay. <coughs> all right. So uh, yeah, it's pretty simple. It's a simple post request with this URL, with this body. And this URL points to the zero image you can see on the right. So I have a little CURL command here that does exactly that. I'll put it in my terminal. OK, let's use this one. Large so everyone can see. And be at, pay, pay attention because you're see the you're gonna see the calls. Calls. Are we? I tested it before the before this began, so maybe it's warmed up already. Yeah. So we'll see how long it takes to shut down. Okay, it's pretty slow, so we're probably seeing a cold start now. All right, we we got a digit zero, so that's correct. And if I run it again, it should be much faster. Yep, because that's the the it's warmed up now. Uh, we have, a, we have another example just to show you how fun machine learning can be. So check out this number two digit. It's pretty different from the, from the data. 
that this was trained on. So the whole data set is just these black and white images. And we're actually feeding it this red to on a white background. But yep, digit two. So it worked even for this. It's pretty interesting. <coughs> All right. So live demo worked, which is great. Doesn't always happen. Yay! And now our production machine learning system is complete. And our emojis are broken, which is Google's fault. If I exit full screen, you can see them here. So yeah. Um, all right. And Andre, do you want to finish up with the alternative approaches? Yeah. So just so that we don't talk about our approach, uh, we can briefly cover what, what we could do as well as a similar approaches. There's a Python tool called Zappa, which can also deploy um, Python um, applications to the Lambda. It's usually used with Python web applications, but you could also use it for machine learning projects. So the way it handles the fact that Python packages are so big is that it deploys them not onto Lambda directly, but it deploys them onto like S3 bucket, and then your Lambda will pull those packages from the S3 bucket, and Zappa sort of provides a wrapper that does this for you. There's also Google Cloud functions, just to uh, mention a competitor to AWS. They recently um, started supporting uh, cloud, uh, cloud functions for Python in beta. And basically, they claim to basically install your packages for yourself. So you don't have to package them yourself and put them onto the, their basically uh, cloud function, uh, which we actually haven't tried. But I mean, it seems like it could work. And that's it. Yeah, and that concludes our talk. Thank you again for uh, coming and listening to us. You can use this shortened URL to access these slides if you want to click around, go to GitHub or whatever. <coughs> and we're always hiring, always looking to have good conversations. So like I said, our doors and Carlin are welcome. So um, yeah, we'll be glad to have a chat with you. Thanks. Thank you.